All right. Thank you all for joining. We have a lot of participants today. Um, you all are automatically muted, as Autumn said, and I am hoping that now you can hear me. If you cannot hear me, please drop that in the Q&A. And that's where any questions during the webinar, you'll, um, I will be monitoring, to, monitoring that for Autumn. And we will, I will try to pop in with questions or we will answer them at the end. Okay, I don't see any responses, so I'm going to assume that you can hear me. If you can hear me, Autumn, they should be able to hear me. Also. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We might have a few more tra um, trailing in as we get started, but we are so appreciative of you all um, spending your time with us. We know your time is valuable. So we are going to um, get with this and get it going. And I see some raised hands here. And if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. And I don't see any new ones in the Q&A, so unless you have a question. All right. We welcome you. We are with Mission West Virginia, and we are leading a statewide effort to promote positive futures for all kids in West Virginia. We work alongside families as they navigate West Virginia's foster care system, and we also provide evidence-based life skills education to help teens envision and create positive futures. As a result of our work, putting kids first in collaboration with social services, school districts, private foster care agencies, and other nonprofits, much like a lot of you out there, the future does look brighter for West Virginia. From our process with um, support for those interested in foster care or kinship care to help understand the system, find a placement agency, and prepare to make a meaningful difference in the life of a child. And if you're interested in learning more about fostering or kinship care, um, you can um, call 1-866-CALL-MWV or 304-512-0555. And you can also request an information packet on our website, and there is the website information. And even if you're interested um, and you're in the exploration to see if it's something for you, go ahead and call and get our information package. That doesn't mean that you're automatically signed up for the process, but you can just kind of figure out um, if that's something that you're interested in. But the program we're highlighting today is the THINK program, and that stands for Teaching Health Instead of Nagging Kids. And we empower teens to make positive life choices through education, life skills, and coaching. Our program is evidence-based, and it helps the students we work with navigate social-emotional pressures that all of us, even when we were teens, we faced as we developed. This includes building healthy relationships, healthy choices around drugs and alcohol, and pregnancy prevention. We deliver our program in partnership with the schools in, a, in 20 counties, and we're just excited that we get to do that. Many of you all represent some of those counties that we're in. We are vetted by the district leaders, the teachers, and other school leaders who are trained to work with kids. And because we're evidence-based curriculum, it has shown to have a positive effect on preventing teen pregnancies, sexually transmitted infections, or high sexual risk behaviors. Our educators are continually trained in the most up-to-date information on trauma, sexual health, and high-risk behavior. Our management team does on-site observations of our educators regularly to ensure that fidelity is being followed. We also administer pre and post surveys we get teacher feedback, we have team focus groups, and we also have site satisfaction surveys. So do we do all that we can to make sure that we are delivering a program that is um, age appropriate 
and and helps and really truly makes a difference. And we know that it takes a whole community to help teens envision and create those positive futures. That's why we also provide resources and training to equip parents, families, and the individuals who support adolescents as they navigate their teen years. That includes workshops and trainings about talking to youth about sensitive or hard topics, hidden in plain sight, trauma, sexual assault, assault prevention and consent, teen dating violence, and much, much more. And a lot of it is like the workshop that we're going to do here today with Autumn on um, self-harm. We are happy to announce that we are currently working on becoming a social work CEU provider. And so CEUs for this webinar will be offered for social work by Mission West Virginia. Um, as you know, our evaluation must be completed in order to be considered for those CEUs. And attendance will be cross-referenced with the Zoom attendance log. So if you're on a computer and there's more than one person watching this, please put in the chat box um, your who all is on that webinar so we can make sure everybody who is watching does um, get credit for attending. We will drop a link to the survey in the chat box and we will, a link will also go out via email to all participants. And that probably won't happen until Friday. And then we will also process those certificates starting Friday um, in the order that they're received. And if you have any questions, you can email rwhiteadmissionwv.org. And I will pop in. Whoops. I will pop in that link in just a little bit in your chat box. But today we're going to introduce Autumn. She is our resource, uh, youth resource coordinator here at Mission West Virginia. She has done multiple webinars and trainings throughout the state and nationally for us. She has her bachelor's and master's in social work from the University of Akron and is a licensed social worker in West Virginia. In her position, she works closely with students who identify a need for resources or community referrals. She also provides education on numerous top topics and acts as a bridge of support for students who not need, just need a trusted adult to speak with and help them work through difficult situations that they may experience. We are so excited that Autumn is part of our staff and she brings all her many skills and her talents and that she is sharing them with you today. So, we are going to welcome Miss Autumn and let her do what she does best. Let's get started. It would help if I am on mute. Um, can you give me back the host? Um, or if you know how to do it, Miss Rita, um, our chat is some, for some reason, it is disabled. So if you can enable the chat um, so people okay. can send the messages and stuff like that. And I also see another question. We are, um, all the people that are on this webinar have been automatically muted. So you do not okay. need to worry about that at all. Okay. I'm working on how to get you, um, changed over. Actually, let me see. I apologize to you all out there. Technology is not my strong point. Um, I know how to do Zoom meetings, but webinars oh, we go. are just a little different. All right, I just reclaimed as the um, as the host, so we are good. All right, um, the chat. Issue should be fixed now. Here, I will type in something real quick. <laughs> Amanda, chat is up, everybody. <laughs> 
And yes, so cameras and audios are muted. I do not see anybody but Miss Rita and myself. So um, if you are working from home and in your pajamas or eating um, good food and snacks, then we were, that's fine. I can't see you at all. So um, just sit back, relax, and we will get started. And then I am going to um, take my video off. Uh, just because I am doing this from home and I am back in the holler in Calhoun County. And so um, somebody else had mentioned that when they're at home, if they have their video on, it sucks all the internet. And I totally understand that because mine does as well. And then I will share my screen and we will get started because we have lots of stuff to talk about today. Okay, share screen. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, today's presentation is on self-harm. I know that some of you may have attended a self-harm a webinar that I did a month or so ago. That one was more geared towards like community members, family members, caregivers, and things like that. So this, there is going to be some similar things on there, but the treatment aspect I, is going to be more clinical based. Um, so there might be some things that you remember me talking about. Um, and that's okay, because I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I, if I hear things over and over again, then it helps me to grasp onto it a little bit better. Me, um, if nobody is, has met me before, my name is Autumn Wagner, um, and I'm the Youth Resource Coordinator at Mission West Virginia. My hometown, I was born and raised in Akron, Ohio. I lived there my whole life, and I despise Ohio. So if there's anybody out there that's from Ohio, I am so sorry. But I just was never a city person, and I spent a lot of time coming down to West Virginia as a kid and an adult, and West Virginia always felt like home to me. So finally, in 2019, I decided to move here. Um, I live in Arnoldsburg, which is in Calhoun County, and it's been the best thing ever. I absolutely love this state. I love the people in this state. And yes, my roots may be from Akron, Ohio, and my heart is is definitely a West Virginia girl. And I will tell you that my heart is a lot bigger than my roots. So I like to see myself as a West Virginia girl, but um, I don't have the Q accent or anything that like that, but it's okay. Uh, my education, I have a bachelor's and master's in social work, and I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker here. And some of my previous experiences, I have worked with older adults. I've worked in addictions, corrections, uh, mental health. And then before I came to Mission West Virginia, I was a mental health therapist for adults and teenagers. So, um, as some of you may know, anytime I talk about anything related to mental health, I always put disclaimers. Um, I definitely don't want people to be using this as a way to diagnose people, but this is just for educational purposes. Um, and also, the things we talk about can contain sensitive content, and, you know, I don't know everybody's stories. So, if there is anything that I am talking about, if it's making you upset, if it's bothering you, please, please, please go take care of yourself. Uh, when I work with the youth, that is always my priority. I want all the youth to feel safe and comfortable when we're talking and working together. So if there's something like if you need to step out, whatever you need to do, please make sure you do that. And also, if you have any mental health concerns for yourself or somebody else, it is so important to make sure that you are um, receiving proper assessments, diagnoses, and treatment from a licensed professional. Um, I have a lot of youth that like to self-diagnose um, based off of 
TikTok and stuff like these quizzes they find online. Um, and I'm not going to lie. There was a point in my life where, yes, I would self-diagnose myself. And did it help? Absolutely not. But it just seemed easier to just label me with something than to make a doctor's appointment and wait to go see what they said. Because, you know, I apparently have my PhD and I'm a medical person because I was on Google. So when we look at self-harm, um, you know, what exactly is it? So self-harm is basically when a person is hurting themselves on purpose. And what's important to know is that when we look at self-harm, some people, if they know someone that self-harms, they believe that they are attempting suicide, but self-harm is not actually a suicide attempt. But we do know that nearly half of people who engage in self-harm have attempted suicide in the past, and the rate rises to 70% for adolescents. So when people are self-harming, it's not necessarily an attempt to end their life, but um, just because they're self-harming doesn't make them immune from attempting suicide sometime down the road. Um, self-injury is often called, um, or self-harm is also called um, self-injury or NSSI, which is non-suicidal self-injury. The most frequent sites that a person may injure themselves are typically on their hands, wrists, stomach, and thighs. Um, although as somebody that injures themselves will hurt themselves anywhere on their body, especially if they feel it's a place that won't be found by somebody else. Another thing that is important about self-harm is that self-harm itself is not an actual mental illness, um, but it's more common in individuals that are already dealing with a mental health issue, such as depression, anxiety, trauma, eating disorders, uh, personality disorders, and things like that. Um, but I know that the people that create the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the diagnostic um, book for all mental health conditions, they are putting in more research um, just because this is becoming so much more common that they may essentially um, make self-harm a disorder itself. Um, but as of now, it is not like an actual mental illness um, or a disorder but it's kind of comes along with other mental health issues. So basically self-harm is just an unhealthy way of coping with emotional um, pain, very intense feelings um, and emotions such as anger and frustration. So when we look at who self-harms, um, you know, there's not a certain population that is completely immune from engaging in self-harm, but the rates do differ among different populations. So when we look at adults, they are the least likely group to follow through with self-injury, and only about 5% of adults have self-injured in their lifetime. Now, with the adults, it doesn't necessarily mean that... Um, you know, if they self-harmed as a teen or a young adult, they may still carry um, through those behaviors when they do become an adult. But if there was no self-harming when they were young, um, then it's very uncommon for adults to start injuring themselves um, at an adult age. Teenagers. So our teens, they have the highest rate of self-injuring behaviors and about 17 admit self-injury at least once in their lifetime. So we see that the 17%, um, and honestly, I think that number is so much higher um, just because these are the teens that are admitting that they have self-injured at least once in their lifetime. Uh, college students um, also struggle with self-injuring and studies shows that about 15% of college students report engaging in self-harm, um, you know, and that's going to be more common, especially if they started this when they were a teenager. And then when we look at women versus men, so women are more likely to self-harm, but males do represent at least 35% of all self-injury cases. Um, it's just that men are more likely to underreport due to lots of different reasons. Um, a big one is stigma. And so we know that mental health already has that stigma, but I feel like that stigma is worse for males uh, just because society has said, you know, you're not tough or you're not strong if you show emotion or you're dealing with mental health issues. Um, so men can and do self-harm. It's just that they underreport it. 
Um, people of LGBTQ+, plus, they are at a very high risk of self-injury, and nearly half of all bisexual females engage in self-injury. Um, there are a lot of um, other things that put people of LGBTQ+, plus at a higher risk, and a lot of that has to do with um, either they been rejected by friends and family because of who they are and how they identify as, or they have that fear of being rejected um, or ret retaliated against from society because of how they identify. Um, and also individuals with intellectual disabilities. So that's what the ID is. Um, so 10% of children and adolescents that have an intellectual disability can develop self-harming behaviors. Um, now the types of or the ways that they self-injure are different than somebody that does not have an intellectual disability. So some of the ways they may injure themselves that are more common is picking at their skin, hand biting, banging their head, and eye gouging. Um, and the reason why people with um, intellectual disability, why they may self-harm if there's changes in their routine, um, if they are presented with a difficult task and they don't know how to perform that task, um, or if they are at a low functioning ability level based on the um, severity of their disability. So when we look at self-harm, uh, self-harm is actually a very, very vicious cycle. He, my husband who is okay with me sharing this, but he is a recovering alcoholic and I've shared this before, but I am recovery from bulimia. And so we've talked about this a lot. And when we look at, you know, unhealthy ways of coping, we all fall under this vicious cycle. It's just the way that we cope is different. So basically where it says the self-harm cycle, I could put that with, I could change self-harm and put bulimia cycle or the alcohol cycle. And we're still going to follow that same thing. It's just the way that we carry out those emotions are a little bit different. So basically what can happen when it comes to self-harming is there may be a situation, thoughts or feelings, and they just become so intense and overwhelming. And so that's when they may start to have that urge to want to hurt themselves in order to release uh, those deep and painful emotions. And especially when they don't know how to deal with these emotions, um, or if they learned as a child to hide your emotions, which I see that now with some of our youth, that they're raised that you don't talk about those things. So then they may turn to self-harm because if they can't talk about it, they have they feel like they have to release it in some way. And they've also um, have shown in scans that when somebody injures themselves, it can stimulate and release endorphins or those pain-killing hormones. So it can really um, raise their mood and make them feel better. And so they think, oh, okay, so this is what I have to to do. It makes me feel better. And then the next time something happens, I'll just do that and all will be good. But as the cycle continues and the self-harming continues, um, sometimes after they self-harm, they're going to experience some deep shame and guilt where they may feel embarrassed or feel really bad. And so again, they have those negative thoughts and feelings that can become overwhelming and then they start the whole cycle again. So then they may self-harm to work through those deep um, emotions and then they're gonna feel guilty and then it starts all over again. So this is just a video on um, a little bit more about self-harm. Self-harm is when a person physically hurts themselves without the intent to die. The official clinical term for self-harm is non-suicidal self-injury. Self-harming may look different for different people. The injuries may be minor to severe and sometimes result in scars, bruises, or health issues. Self-harm usually begins during adolescence or early adulthood, but it is a behavior that can occur in people of all ages. Research shows that young people that are bullied are at higher risk of self-harming. A common misconception is that people who self-harm are all suicidal. Although self-harm is associated with an increased risk of suicidal impulses, there are many people who self-harm who will never have serious suicidal thoughts. It is often used as a way to cope or express feelings. 
Some reasons a person may self-harm are to relieve stress, distract from memories, from bad experiences, feel in control, release or avoid feelings that are overwhelming or cause anger, communicate the pain they are feeling in a visible way, or punish themselves. Although it can seem backwards, for people that self-harm, the act of hurting themselves can actually help them feel better in the moment. Some of the signs that someone may be self-harming are frequent cuts, burns, bruises, or scars, particularly on hands, wrists, stomach, or thighs. Wearing clothing that is not weather appropriate, for example, wearing long sleeve shirts and pants on hot days. Making frequent excuses about injuries, carrying or having sharp objects without a reason. Although self-harm is a behavior, it could be linked to a mental health disorder, such as depression, an eating disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or borderline personality disorder. Treatment provided by a licensed mental health professional can help stop the person from self-harming. Through mental health counseling or therapy, the person will be provided with tools to learn problem-solving skills and healthy ways to cope with their feelings and emotions. Talking about self-harm may be difficult. If you believe someone you know may be self-harming, reserve judgment and encourage them to talk to a licensed mental health professional. If you're a mental or behavioral health provider seeking information on evidence-based treatment, check out our multimedia solution for continuing education and shareable patient resources at psychhub.com. All right, so we also know that we have different types of forms of self-harm. Um, the most common form of self-harm is cutting. So these cuts, um, they can be superficial or they can be uh, severe deep scratches and it's typically done with a sharp object. Uh, scratching, so scratching in the same place over and over again till it breaks the skin can be a form of self-harm. Um, burning themselves, whether using lit matches, cigarettes, um, or anything that's heated or sharp objects such as knives. Carving words or symbols on the skin. Um, Self-hitting, punching, or headbanging, piercing the skin with sharp objects, and also binging and purging. Um, binging and purging was recently recognized as a form of self-harm not too long ago. Um, and, you know, like I had mentioned with my recovery, with my bulimia, you know, it was, it wasn't about body image. It was about um, difficulties of dealing with those, you know, painful emotions. So I was really glad that they put binging and purging as a form of self-harm. So just like everything else, um, everything has risk factors, including self-harm. And so as I'm going through these, I want you to think about, you know, the youth you work with or people you work with and, you know, think about, um, you know, maybe some of you um, experiencing some of these things. So if they're experiencing feelings of defeat, entrapment, rejection, hopelessness, shame, or loss, if um, they feel that they're a burden on others. So if they feel like they're being a burden, then sometimes they think that they have to punish themselves um, to escape those um, harmful feelings and emotions. So that may lead them to self-harm. Feelings of loneliness, social isolation, and, and or social disconnection. Honestly, I think a lot of us felt that uh, during COVID and that's why we have seen such a huge spike in self-harming. Uh, mental illness. So if that or that could include um, if they've been diagnosed with depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, eating disorders, um, or any other kind of trauma, um, you know, these are things that put them at a risk for engaging in self-harm. Life stressors, including relationship problems or having any type of history of trauma or bullying. Um, problems with drugs or alcohol family history of mental health problems, uh, problematic social media use, especially with cyberbullying. So like I had mentioned with COVID, I feel like people are on social media a lot more now than we've ever been. And, you know, when we look at our youth, we know that cyberbullying goes on. Um, it's a 24 seven thing. The youth cannot escape um, being bullied online. Um, so that can really impact their mental health and also lead to self-harming. Um, if a person has unhealthy perfectionism, so, you know, they, everything has to be perfect. Um, they have to meet other people's expectations, not just their own. So that puts a lot of pressure on themselves to perform a certain way. And sometimes those goals and those ideas of performing perfectly is unrealistic. So the smallest thing that they feel um, was not perfect, then that could lead them to harm. 
uh, just being impulsive by nature. So if they have um, a strong personality trait of impulsiveness, so they just go out and they do things and don't think about the consequences uh, could be a risk factor. And then also being exposed to self-harm or suicide of family and friends. So there has always been, you know, some people that think, you know, we shouldn't talk about some of these things because it puts those thoughts and ideas into people's heads, especially the youth. Um, you know, but one thing that is important to know is that talking about self-harm and suicide is not going to put that idea in their head. But we also know that there is a social contagion when it comes to self-harm and suicide, especially with youth. And so basically, you know, if a friend or a school um, like a schoolmate or peer, if they self-harm or they, you know, attempt suicide, it doesn't automatically mean that everybody else around them is going to engage in those behaviors. But if that individual is dealing with any of these other risk factors, um, you know, whether they have trauma or they're engaging in drugs and alcohol or they have depression or anxiety, then it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely going to um, give them that idea, to, you know, that maybe if I do this, this will help me. So when we look at the symptoms, um, I know the video mentioned some of them, but it's typically their scars and they're often in patterns. Um, there could be fresh cuts, scratches, bruises, bite marks, or other wounds. Um, excessive rubbing of an area to create a burn. Um, I don't know if any of you guys did this or had this done, but I know when I was younger and my brother who's older, you know, we were always like picking on each other and fighting. And you know, when somebody like grabs your arm and they twist it and it makes that burning sensation and it would hurt. Um, well, sometimes people may do that in order to create that burning sensation. Um, they may often have keep or keep sharp objects on their hand. Um, they're going to wear long sleeves and pants, even in this hot weather. So today, for example, where I'm at, it is 91 degrees. And I'm sorry for those of you who absolutely love and adore summer, but I'm pretty excited for fall. I'm a little over this heat and humidity. Um, but the problem with this, so obviously we would say, okay, well, something must be going on if they're wearing long sleeves and pants in the hot summer. But if you guys aren't aware, like, if you go on, like, I like to go on TikTok. Number one, the, the videos are hilarious. But number two, it really does help me to understand like, the trend are with our uh, younger people. But the trend right now, as far as styling and clothes, is wearing these big oversized sweatshirts. Um, so I can't tell you the amount of teens that I see when I'm out and about where it's 80, 90 degrees, and they're all wearing these big, you know, big overdrawn sweatshirts. So it's like, okay, is this a trend thing or is there something more going on? So I think with, you know, this new trend, um, it's making it more difficult. They have frequent reports of accidental injury. So if somebody asks them what's, you know, what's on their arm or their hand or their legs, it's always something else. It's I, um, you know, I ran into, you know, the door or the side of the table or my cat scratched me or my dog scratched me. So there's just always an excuse of why they have these fresh wounds on them. Um, they're going to have difficulties in their relationships and they may also make statements of helplessness, hopelessness or feeling worthless. So when we look at why people self-harm, basically we all need a way of coping with our emotions. So if you look at yourself and the difficult emotions that maybe you experienced in the past and you think about ways that you have coped, you know, sometimes we will eat something really sugary, like a big piece of chocolate cake, or some people may go exercise or listen to music. Um, you know, so we all have ways of coping. It's just that people who self-harm, they turn um, to hurting themselves as a way of coping um, because for them, that's the only way they feel that they can manage their emotions. So they may self-harm to process their negative feelings. Uh, I've worked with people in the past where they feel that when they self-harm, it clears their mind. So they're able to think more clearly and think through of everything that's going on. It can help them distract themselves from their negative feelings. So sometimes people feel that their emotional pain is so strong that they just want to feel something else, even if it's physical pain. 
Or another thing that can happen is when somebody is going through so many uh, deep and, and troubling feelings and emotions, a lot of times they feel this overall numbness. They feel like they just have no emotions whatsoever. And truthfully, people don't want to be like a zombie. You know, even though we know we're going to experience difficult emotions, we want to feel something. So sometimes those people that feel numb, um, they may self-harm in order just to feel something at all. Um, it helps them feel that they have control over their lives. Because again, sometimes we, you know, we when we don't feel like we have control over our lives and those situations, we are desperate to find something that we feel that we can control. Um, they may punish themselves for things they think they've done wrong. So they may harm themselves if they think they've done something that they shouldn't have. Or they may self-harm to express emotions that they think are they're embarrassed to show. And this could be for lots of reasons. So maybe they've had friends saying, you know, people that self-harm are crazy or should be locked up in an institute or, you know, mental health in general just doesn't exist. So whatever the case is, you know, if people are embarrassed to show these emotions, they still have to get it out somehow. And so for them, it would be by um, injuring themselves. So another thing that we know is when it comes to self-harm, um, the internet can be really great. Internet and social media can be really, really great. But we also know that um, not all good things are great. And so we know that our internet and our social media can actually cause a lot of issues and create um, worsening of self-harm. And so there is a term called hashtag my secret family that I will go over here next. But the Center for Disease Control found that there was um, more than 1.5 million search results on Instagram alone of this hashtag. Um, and only one third of relevant hashtags generated content advisory warnings. So when people are posting things that could be triggering to other people, they're not posting those warnings. Um, or anything like that. So, you know, somebody could just be scrolling through TikTok and maybe they're trying to recover from self-harm and somebody posts something about self-harm without that warning and it could um, lead them to relapse. The other thing with social media is we know that they're- I'm going to play general. George had an accident on the tractor. I got him in my truck. Okay, sorry. Um, my husband has to take somebody to the hospital. Um, so, Sorry about that. <laughs> so with these hashtags um, on social media platforms, um, you know, these moderators look at it and they try to find things that they, you know, can mark and, and remove. But people are getting a lot more creative with these with these hashtags. So these moderators are having a really hard time finding these videos and taking them down because they're using creative hashtags. So it gets past these moderators. Um, another thing too is there are lots of online support groups and self-harm communities and a lot of these are meant to provide support for people that are suffering. So it's a good way to help each other because if people are going through similar things they can talk about what works for them and what doesn't um, and you know and, and to also help people realize that they're not alone. But the other problem too is there are some um, things online with self-harm that, you know, is not healthy. So they're teaching people how to self-harm and conceal it or, um, you know, ways that you can harm yourself worse without, you know, going too deep or anything like that. So they're kind of encouraging those behaviors, which we know can be very harmful. So here's the hashtag my secret family. So basically, if anybody is experiencing any of these disorders, then they would just put hashtag and whatever name. So if there is a girl that is dealing with self-harm, she might put hashtag cat. Or if a guy is suicidal, he's going to put hashtag Dallas um, in their videos or whatever they're posting. So again, when they are using these names and moderators are looking up, you know, if they look those names up, like it's not going to it's not gonna flag that what they're putting on there could be harmful. 
And this is a story that was um, a couple months ago. And then I actually just saw another story not too long ago, but um, there are families that are now suing Instagram and um, what's the new, is it Meta? Um, so they're suing these platforms uh, due to the, the algorithms that these kids are um, seeing with their Instagram, Facebook, and other platforms. And so this is a 17 year old girl. She liked um, some sad quotes on Instagram and I've done that before, you know, sometimes like when you're in your feels, you come across a sad quote and it just really hits you. And so you're going to like it. Um, but what happens is with these platforms is if you're liking a lot of certain things, then the platform is going to change your algorithm so that you're seeing more and more of the things that you're liking. So because she likes some of these sad quotes, she started getting um, videos um, on, you know, in content on suicide, self-harm um, and mental health. And so this 17 year old girl actually had attempted suicide and she was hospitalized um, for a while. And, you know, when she put on here that these algorithms and these videos and content that's being posted online, um, they're making self-harm look glamorous. So this is just the content warning. Um, this is not video, but there are some images that can be um, difficult to look at. So these are just some examples of things that I found online that are kind of glorifying self-harm. So over here on the left side, we have um, the girl showing her wrist and she has a cut so you can see that that cut is not very deep. It's more of a superficial cut. Um, I don't care if people have superficial cuts or if they have deep cuts, self-harm is self-harm. Um, just because somebody says, oh, it's a superficial cut, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that they're engaging in self-harm. It, it really, it does. Because the idea is behind, the, you know, the their way of feeling that, okay, I'm feeling bad, so I'm gonna cut myself in order to feel good. So there is that one. Uh, we have the guy below um, where it says girl self-harm, but so do guys. Um, you can see at the top on the left hand who carved the words. Um, I hate myself, ugly, um, into her thigh. And then there are like quotes that they put on here, such as, see no scars, but it's all lies. They only check wrists, not thighs. Um, so again, that can encourage people to, um, you know, start engaging in self-harm somewhere else on their body. Then we have some of these TikToks. So the girl, um, the one top with the dark hair says, when your wrist is too obvious, so you switch to your legs, but now every time you wear shorts, you have scars and you tell people they're just cat scratches, but you don't even have a cat. Um, and then the girl at the bottom with the blonde hair, when she talks about um, the way it's, when it stings way worse in the shower the next morning. Um, so talking about self-harming um, and when you get it exposed to water, it stings. We have the person that has the scars on their um, upper arm and their lower arm. And then in the middle, it says Madison Beer reveals she's one year clean of self-harm in emotional Instagram post. So if you are not familiar with Madison Beer, she is an influencer and a singer. Uh, she was made famous by Justin Bieber. And although it's awesome that, you know, she's revealed she's been one year clean of self-harm. Um, the one thing I, and, you know, they look up to her as a role model and an influencer and, you know, it's like, oh, well, if Madison Beer used to self-harm, then maybe it's something I can do. So it's just always concerning that, you know, when, these influencers have millions of followers, especially really young people, that even though they are in recovery, it will um, trigger them to engage in self-harm. So these are some really great website resources on self-harm. So the crisis text line has uh, lots of information on self-harm, helpguide.org. The Jed Foundation is um, a foundation. This website is geared towards uh, teens and adolescents um, that talks about mental health, uh, suicide, and self-harm. We have the MA MHA National, so that's the Mental Health America. Um, they have lots of information on mental disorders as well as self-harm. NAMI is our National Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, SAMHSA, that's our Substance Abuse and Mental Health um, Services. 
the selfinjuryinstitute.com and the Trevor Project. Uh, the Trevor Project is geared towards LGBTQ plus um, that goes into um, self-harm and suicide. So these are all really great resources and websites that if you were wanting to get more information or get resources or handouts, um, these are really excellent websites. All right, so next we are going to be looking at treatment for self-harm. So although um, self-harm is not an actual disorder, the DSM has made criteria of what counts as somebody who engages in self-harm. So we have different types of criteria that they have to meet. So the first one is that they have engaged in um, self-harming on five or more days in the past year, which truthfully, um, you know, five days in a whole year isn't a whole lot. So I do like that because, you know, it just shows that you don't have to self-harm constantly or chronically that if you just do it five times within the year, then you're going to meet that criteria. Um, the next criteria is that there is an expectation that self-harming is going to solve an interpersonal problem or provide relief from those um, unpleasant thoughts or emotions and induce a positive emotional state. The next criteria is that they have to ex experience um, one or more of the following. So these interpersonal problems or negative thoughts or emotions um, happen immediately before self-injuring. They have preoccupation with self-injuring that's difficult to manage. So it's starting to interfere with different things in their life. And they also have frequent thoughts about um, self-injuring. The next criteria is that self-injuring is not socially sanctioned or restricted to minor self-injurious behaviors. Um, you know, again, like the one girl in that picture that I showed you that had what seemed like a superficial cut, um, you know, a mental health professional or some type of licensed professional would have to determine, um, you know, if, if those are just minor self-injury behaviors. Uh, the fifth is that the, the presence of self-harming um, causes uh, significant distress across domains of their life. So it's not just interfering with their emotions. It's interfering with their relationships, their work, their school, their friendships. Um, it's causing issues in all of those areas. And then the last is that self-harming does not occur only in the context of psychosis, delirium, or substance use, or withdrawal, um, or that it's not accounted for by, the, by another psychiatric disorder or medical condition. Um, so we know that during psychosis or somebody who is delirious or if they are um, abusing substances or going through withdrawal, um, they may not consider you know, self-harming to be actual self-harming. They're going to consider that to be a part of the psychosis or the substance use or withdrawal. So when we look at effective therapies um, for self-harm, so psychotherapy is going to be the first line of treatment, any type of therapy. Uh, medications can also be used and can be helpful, especially if they're treating other psychiatric issues, um, such as depression, anxiety, eating disorders, uh, BPD, or PTSD. Um, so with the effective therapies, um, if anybody attended my clinical eating disorder presentation last week or maybe the week before, um, you will know that we talked about CBT and DBT. So I also put those on here um, again because we know that <laughs> CBT and DBT, uh, bless you, whoever sneezed, <laughs> we know that CBT and DBT are very, very, very effective therapies for lots of different um, disorders, including self-harm. So I will go over those again in case somebody did not attend that eating disorder webinar. But then we're also going to talk about the other two um, that are also effective at treating self-harm. So the first one is problem-solving therapy, and then the other is psychodynamic. So when we look at cognitive behavior therapy, so CBT is a short-term and present-oriented therapy that looks at solving current problems and modifying our dysfunctional ways of thinking and our behaviors. So with CBT, it's not going back and looking in the past. It's looking at the here and now and what's going on and how our here and now is creating these behaviors based on how we think and feel. Um, so CBT has found that our thoughts and feelings and behaviors are all related. We know that we behave based on the way that we feel and what we think. 
Um, it can be treat, used to treat a wide variety of mental health issues. So depression, anxiety, substance use, eating disorders, severe mental health um, issues. We just know that CBT is um, very effective at lots of mental health issues. Um, and that it also has um, been proven to show actual change in people. So we know that it's evidence-based and that it does um, produce change. This is a very, very, very popular um, method of treatment, and it's just as effective, if not more effective, than other types of therapy as well as psychiatric medication. So when it comes to CBT, um, they have the core principles. So we know with CBT, um, they see that psychological problems are based in part or fault or on faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking. So we know the reason why we have these problems is because the way we think is producing these unhealthy ways of coping. Um, the other principle is that psychological problems are based in part on learned patterns of unhelpful behaviors. So that's very common um, depending on how a person grew up. If they were exposed to um, family members self-harming or abusing drugs and alcohol or engaging in eating disorders as a way of coping, then that puts them at a higher risk for developing those unhealthy coping patterns. And then lastly, we know that people suffering from psychological problems can learn better ways of coping with them. So when they find better ways of coping, it's going to relieve their symptoms and they're going to become so much more effective in their lives. So one of the parts of CBT is it helps to change thinking patterns. So when we learn to recognize our distorted ways of thinking that's creating our problems. Sometimes we can say, okay, well, I'm telling myself this, but what's the reality of what I'm thinking? So it helps us to reevaluate our thoughts in terms of reality. So an example um, that I've had, I have had a youth um, when I was in Ohio, you know, they were um, dealing with anxiety and they were having troubles focusing and concentrating. So they're in my office and they are talking about how, you know, they have um, this test coming up and they can't study and they feel that because they can't study, they're going to fail. And they think because they're going to fail that test, they're going to fail the class. If they fail the class, they're going to fail school. And then they eventually decided that because they were going to fail school, that they were um, down the road, they predicted that they're going to be homeless and jobless and living on the streets, all because they have this anxiety that they can't study for this test. So when we are using CBT, we help them to kind of pull back and say, okay, let's let's reevaluate the situation and what is most likely to happen if you don't fail that test. You know, could you fail the class? Yes. But does that mean you're going to fail all of school? Most likely not. Um, so that's one thing that I really like about that because our way of thinking and our brain can be our worst enemy. CBT also helps us gain a better understanding of our behaviors um, and motivation of others. And we use problem solving skills to cope when we have these difficult situations and we can learn to develop a greater sense of confidence in our own abilities. Um, so again, that's part of changing those thinking patterns. CBT also changes behavior, uh, behavior patterns as well. So it helps us to face our fears instead of avoiding them. Uh, we are very good at avoiding things that we are fearful of. And I get that because nobody wants to be um, scared or to feel afraid, but that also makes, um, you know, makes things more challenging in order for us to recover and work through it when we just avoid it. So CBT helps us at looking at facing some of our fears rather than hiding from them. And it also uses role play to prepare for um, problematic interactions with others because sometimes the way other people behave um, can trigger our own thoughts and feelings, which then in turn trigger some unhealthy behaviors. And then it also helps us learn to calm our mind and relax our body. So I did put a little note down here that when doing CBT, um, a therapist may not use all of these strategies. And that's what I love about it. You can kind of pick and choose what you think is going to work best for the patient. Um, and then you and the patient or whoever you're working with can develop some type of treatment plan um, to decide which parts of that CBT you would like or that person would like to focus on. These are some really great resources for CBT. 
Uh, the Cognitive Behavior Therapy Basics and Beyond is a book that I highly recommend. Um, it was written by Judith Beck. She is the daughter of Aaron Beck. And so they were the ones that created CBT. So the beckinstitute.org, uh, therapistaid.com has a lot of free CBT uh, handouts that you can download and print. Thinkcbd.com, apa.org, which is our American um, Psych Psychiatric Association, and then psychcentral.com. Our next therapy is dialectical behavior therapy or DBT. So DBT is a branch off of CBT. Um, and this was initially created for borderline personality disorder. Um, if any of you have never attended any type of training or have um, learned or read more about DBT, I highly recommend it. Um, DBT is a very, very effective, um, and it's a really great therapy. Honestly, I feel like everybody, all of us, we could all use some DBT and CBT in our life. Um, but one thing about DBT that, that I truly appreciate is the person who created DBT was Marsha Linehan. So Marsha Linehan created dialectical behavior therapy, and she initially created DBT for people that had borderline personality disorder and um, had suicidal risks and self-harmed. And the reason why she created that is because she herself um, has battled lots of mental health issues, including borderline personality disorder with the history of suicide attempts and self-harm. So she, you know, took her experiences and created this therapy, um, you know, to help people that were going through similar things that she was going through. And as DBT gained more popularity, they started to find that DBT can basically be effective treatment for all sorts of mental health disorders. So people that are dealing with, um, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, bipolar, borderline um, personality disorder, eating disorders, anxiety disorder, uh, major depressive disorder, self-harming, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress, substance use, suicidal behavior, you name it, DBT is very effective. So there are four sections of DBT and there are four goals. So the first main goal is to teach people how to live in the moment. The next is to develop healthy ways to cope with stress. The third is to regulate their emotions. And the fourth is improving relationships with others. So those four goals kind of go along with these four sections that DBT has. So the first section is the core mindfulness. So this is teaching mindfulness skills to people. Um, and mindfulness helps people to focus and live in the moment. And it helps them to pay attention on what's happening inside. So, you know, when we have somebody that self-harms, if they're dealing with these intense thoughts and feelings, then they're going to be more impulsive to just start harming themselves. But when they develop these mindfulness skills, they really become more in tune to what they're thinking and feeling. And essentially that goal is to help them recognize, okay, my thinking is an unhealthy place right now. And what can I do to cope in a healthy way rather than just automatically going and injuring myself? Um, so it also uses our senses to tune in and focus on what's happening around you. So, you know, when we look at mindfulness and try to bring us back in that moment, we talk about the things that we see, the things we smell, hear, touch, and taste. And we do this in a non judgmental way because if we are about when it comes to mindfulness skills, then they are going to be less likely to um, be effective because we're going to say, all right, this is really stupid. So I'm not going to do this. So it's also really important that we are non-judgmental when we're um, practicing mindfulness. So mindfulness also helps us to slow down and on using those healthy coping skills when we have that emotional pain. So it's going to help us with those impulses. And it also helps us to stay calm um, and avoid engaging in automatic negative thought patterns and those impulsive behaviors. So that last part is very similar to CBT, how when we have these automatic negative thoughts, it can allow us to just impulsively behave in an unhealthy way. So practicing that mindfulness is going to allow us to think it through through before we act. Our next is distress tolerance. So with DBT and distress tolerance, um, this is basically just accepting 
ourselves and the current situation that we are in. So um, this looks into a lot about radical acceptance. So radical acceptance is really just accepting reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. And so one thing that if it's still kind of like, okay, I'm not sure what that means. If you've ever heard the phrase or somebody has ever told you, oh, it is what it is. Um, I can't stand that phrase. I hate when people tell me it is what it is um, because I, I get that, but that's not how I want it to be. But I know that sometimes when people say it to me in a certain context, it can make my emotions worse. It, it can bring up some anger, frustration, and then I'm not thinking clearly, which can lead me to act impulsively. So with this radical acceptance, it helps us on how to handle um, a crisis situation and just kind of be in the moment and say, okay, I'm in a crisis, but let's not overreact. Let's think it through and figure out ways that we can work through it. So there's a lot of distraction techniques, um, improving the moments. So that's making a crisis situation bearable. There's also um, skills to teach self-soothing and also skills to help us think about pros and cons of not tolerating distraction. So with distress tolerance, um, these skills and these tools help us prepare for these intense emotions. And then it also kind of empowers us to cope with them. And then we're able to have a more positive outlook on life when we can finally see that I can handle this situation in a healthy way. The next is interpersonal um, effectiveness. So this is helping us to become more assertive in relationships and just being able to have a healthy relationship all around. Um, it helps us to be able to tell people no. It helps us to get our needs and our wants met without being manipulative. Um, so basically it's just allowing us and teaching us just to have these overall healthy relationships with other people. Because we know that our interpersonal lives can definitely impact us. The relationships that we have around us um, can hurt us and be toxic to us, which can lead to self-harm. So it can also teach us uh, communication skills and how to deal with uh, challenging people and to respect them, um, but to give ourselves respect, but also them as well. So one thing with DBT, with their skills training, they have a lot of acronyms. They use a lot of acronyms, which is great. It helps us to remember them. Um, so this is an example for the interpersonal effectiveness section. It's called Give. And so this is um, how we can have a healthy conversation with somebody. So the first is we need to be gentle. So when we're talking with somebody, don't attack, threaten, or judge them because we know when we do any of those, it's going to create animosity and it's going to create arguments arguing. Um, and then the next is interest. So show interest with good listening skills. Don't interrupt somebody when they're speaking, make good eye contact, have good body language. Again, we know how frustrating it is when we're trying to talk to somebody and they're on their phone or they're looking away or somebody who's talking to you, they have their arms crossed. Um, you know, it can kind of come off as being a little bit defensive. So we want to make sure that we have those good listening skills. The next is to validate. So obviously we want to acknowledge the other person's thoughts and feelings. Um, it's not going to be helpful in that relationship if somebody is kind of word vomiting all of their, you know, problems and how they're feeling. And we're just like, well, that, that sucks, but at least it's not as bad as this. Um, it's not helpful. So we want to make sure that we are validating them. And then the last is to be easy. So try to have an easy attitude and smile and be lighthearted when we're having conversations. And then um, the last Autumn, part, Autumn, we have a yes. few questions. I don't know if this is a good time or if you want to, we can table them. Um, but one of them is, are there any residential facilities that have CBT or DBT therapies for adults? Okay. Um, is there any research on the effect effectiveness of DBT for reactive attachment disorder? Okay. And then this um, one wants information okay. about an older client and self-harming. All right. Um, so I don't know if you want to answer those at the end or if, since you're discussing DBT, if that would be a good mm -hmm. breaking. Sure. Point. So um, for residential facilities that have um, CBT or DBT therapists, um, I would need to research that for you. 
So the good thing is because CBT and DBT are used so frequently that um, there are lots of therapists that have experience using those. So I can't imagine that it would be difficult to find somebody. Now, as far as like a, like a residential facility, um, you know, like the way that they, I mean, each facility is different. Some may do more longer term therapy, but um, realistically in residential facilities, um, because they're only going to be there for a short period of time, they typically don't get involved into more longer term therapies. Um, but the other good thing is CBT and DBT are actually more short term. So I would have to look into that. And so for the effectiveness of DBT for the reactive attachment disorder, um, that I would have to look at. So I know like with the reactive attachment disorder, you know, that can be more common in younger, younger kids. And so I'm not exactly sure like with DBT, like how that works um, for young kids. So I have experience working with teens and um, adults. So I can definitely look into that for you though. Um, so we will save that, uh, Rita. So we'll make sure that we save those and I can look up, look up that information and then we can get that out um, at some point. Does that sound good? Okay. <laughs> so um, the last part of DBT is with emotion regulation. So with emotion regulation, this is basically teaching us to identify our emotions. Um, and when we have these emotions that we are able to have a healthy balance of them. So with emotion regulation, some people may be completely emotionally numb, or they may be on the opposite spectrum where they think, feel, and live through their emotions. So their emotions just take complete and total control over their lives. So with emotion regulation, we're trying to find that healthy balance where they're still able to express those emotions, but in a more healthy way. So the skills with emotion regulation they help us to identify those emotions, put a name to them, and then also change those emotions as well. Because we know too, that if we are thinking um, and breathing and our emotions are completely taking over our whole lives, then sometimes we're going to act in a way that we shouldn't necessarily be acting because you know our, our emotions have taken over. So it's really hard for us to put a stop to that. Um, so you're able to identify and name those emotions, we can also start to change them. And when a person can recognize and cope with those intense and negative emotions, it can reduce their emotional vulnerability, and then it allows them to have more positive emotional experiences. So these are some DBT resources, um, the Cognitive Behavioral Treatment of Borderline Personality Disorder. This is the uh, manual from Marsha Linehan. So this goes over all of DBT. And then she also has a skills manual book that has all of the worksheets with all the skills and tools um, that are needed. So this is a really, really excellent book. And the skills manual is beautiful. I absolutely love it. And the patients that I have used um, or the patients that I have worked with with DBT also loved it as well. So we have the websites, the dbt.com. Um, we have dbt self-help, lenahaninstitute.org, uh, behavioraltech.org, and also psychpoint.com. So our next is our problem-solving therapy. Um, this is actually a really cool therapy and it's not like, it's, it's not, um, I don't know how to put it. It's not, it's not a very complicated therapy. It's just solving our, our problems, but it's a form of therapy that um, helps and provides people with tools to identify and solve their problems from life stressors. And this can be both big problems as well as small. And the key is to managing the impact of stressful life events and how to address them as they arise. So it helps us to solve these problems because when we're able to solve them as they come, then overall emotionally, we're gonna be a lot more healthy. 
So this is a very practical approach, and this only looks at the present rather than going into the past. And the goal is to improve overall quality of life and reduce the negative impact um, of psychological and physical illness. So over here, you can see some of the benefits. So it helps us to make effective decisions, gives us the confidence that we can handle problems. It gives us a toolbox of problem solving strategies. Um, it's a syst systematic approach to problem solving. So there's, you know, steps and the ability to identify our stressors and our triggers. So when we look at the techniques, there are two, um, two types that they look at. So the first is they apply a positive problem solving orientation. So when they are doing it um, or applying this positive problem solving orientation, they're looking at it in a few ways. So they're looking at this problem in an optimistic light. A lot of times when we think of problems, we are pessimistic. We're like, oh my gosh, this is never going to get better. But we know when we tell ourselves those things, then emotionally, um, we never feel better. It also helps a person to embrace self-efficacy. So it really empowers them uh, to learn that they can do these things and they can solve these problems on their own. And then also it's accepting the idea that problems are a normal part of life. Um, unfortunately, we cannot just steer clear of problems. I wish that was the case, but that would be too easy. So, but it helps us understand that, okay, this is something I'm going to deal with, but I'm going to be prepared and be able to work through it effectively. And then they also have the using the problem solving skills. So these are behaviors that you can rely on to help you navigate those conflicts, even when you are feeling overly stressed. So some of the skills include knowing how to identify a problem, defining the problem in a helpful way, trying to understand that problem more deeply, setting goals related to the problem, generating alternative creative solutions to the problem, choosing the best course of action, implementing the choice you have made and evaluating the outcome to determine those next steps. And then these are the other um, problem solving therapy techniques. So they have the planful problem solving. So basically these, these are, this comes in four stages. So our first is the problem def definition formulation. So we are going to identify that real life problem that needs to be solved and formulate it in a way that allows us to find solutions because sometimes when our emotions are taking over, we think that there is going to be no end to our problems that we're never going to be able to solve it. The next step is a generation of alternative solutions. So basically this is just brainstorming um, other ways to address a problem rather than just having that only one way of managing it. And it's always good to have more than one way because we may find um, or create a way to solve a problem, but it doesn't mean it's always going to work. So if it doesn't work, then we're going to beat ourselves up, which could lead us to engaging in our unhealthy behavior. So we want to make sure that we are creating more than just one solution. The next stage is decision-making strategies. So this involves discussing uh, different strategies for making decisions as well as identifying obstacles um, that can get in the way of solving the problem at hand. And then the last is uh, solution implementation and verification. So this stage, we have implemented a cho chosen solution, and then we verify whether it was affecting, effective in addressing that problem or not. So if it wasn't effective in addressing the problem, then we can go back um, to our other alternative solutions that we created earlier. And then um, these are some other ones. So we have problem solving multitasking. This helps us learn to think clearly and solve problems effectively during times of stress. We have the SSTA. So that is the stop, slow down, think and act. So this encourages us to become emotions when we're faced with conflict. So again, it can become overwhelming and then we may uh, react impulsively. But if we do this technique of stop, slow down, think and act, then we're going to think things through and before we make our action or um, our decision. We also have healthy thinking and imagery. So this more positive self-talk while problem solving. So basically just telling us like, you got this, you can do it. 
And then these are some resources. So this is the Problem Solving Therapy book um, by Jay Haley. So there are lots of books um, on problem solving therapy, but if you were wanting to look into more information about it, I would stick with ones that were um, authored by Jay Haley. Um, but we have the APA.org, um, the SPRC. So that's the Suicide Prevention Resource Center has some information on problem solving therapy, psychologytools.com and therapist aid. And then our last and final therapy that we will discuss is our psychodynamic therapy. So psychodynamic is basically having a deeper understanding of our emotions and our mental processes. Um, it helps us to gain a greater insight into how we think and feel. So therefore, if we have greater insight of how we think and feel, we're going to have better insight of how those um, feelings and thoughts um, correlate with our behaviors. So when we improve this understanding, we're going to make better choices about our lives, as well as work on improving our relationships with other people. Um, psychodynamic therapy is rooted in psychoanalytic theory. So if any of you are familiar with Sigmund Freud, um, he's kind of our father of psychology. Um, it's rooted in his theory, but it's different. Um, it's a less intensive and lengthy process than the traditional psychoanalyst um, that Freud has created. But psychodynamic therapy does place a great deal of emphasis on a patient's relationships with other people in the outside world. And it's been shown to be just as effective as CBT. So how the psychodynamic therapy works, um, it helps people recognize repressed emotions and our unconscious influences that are affecting our current behavior. So again, you know, especially if we have dealt with some trauma, um, a lot of times what can happen is if somebody doesn't receive uh, treatment for that trauma, they're going to have a lot of repressed emotions and these influences that are in their unconscious mind, and it could be affecting their behaviors and they have no idea. Um, because they don't think about it. It's just kind of coming out um, because it hasn't been dealt with in a healthy way. Uh, so sometimes people are going to act in certain ways or respond to others for reasons that they don't really understand. Um, if you've ever had a moment where like you were so heated at something and you may have said or done something and afterwards you were just like, I probably shouldn't have said that. I probably should have done that. I should have done that in a different way. Well, that could be because you may have some uh, repressed emotions or unconscious influences that are going on in our brain. Our brain is a very complicated thing. Um, psychodynamic therapy also helps people learn to acknowledge, bear, and put in perspective their emotional lives. Um, and it also helps us learn how to express our emotions in more adaptive and healthier ways. Uh, so the aspects of psychodynamic therapy. So first, we're going to be identifying our patterns. Um, it helps us recognize the patterns of our behaviors and our relationships and how those interact with one another. Um, because we often develop characteristic ways of responding to our problems without being aware. I just talked about that the last slide. So when we can learn to spot them, um, it can help us find new approaches to coping with those problems rather than just acting irrationally or impulsively. The next is understanding our emotions. Research has found that psychodynamic therapy is very useful for exploring and understanding our emotions um, through gaining insight with these emotions. We're, we're better able to recognize patterns that may have contributed to our um, problematic behaviors and then make those changes more readily. So when we look at self-harm, when we have better insight of our emotions, then we're going to be able to understand, okay, maybe this is why I was, I was self-harming because of these emotions. So when we can understand that, then we can look at making changes and doing something that's more healthy. And then also it's, um, for improving relationships. Uh, the last slide mentioned that relationships is a key focus with psych psychodynamic therapy, um, Honestly, I think all therapy should look at the aspects with relationships because I think uh, relationships that we have with other people can be huge factors into how we cope with our emotions. So this is the uh, Brief Psychodynamic Psychotherapy book um, that I recommend. And then some of those resources, uh, you could use the APA.org, Good Therapy, um, Psychology Today, and Simply Psychology. 
So when we are looking at, um, you know, talking to somebody, if we have questions um, or concerns about somebody that may be self-harming, it is so important to talk to that person about it. Um, I had mentioned earlier that some people think if we talk about it, it's going to cause it, um, but talking about it will not cause it. If they had thoughts of self-harming, they've had those thoughts in their mind way before you ever asked them about it. Um, but if, if a professional isn't afraid to talk about self-harming and they come about it in a way that's non-judgmental, um, then the patient can slowly start to consider other alternatives to coping in a healthy way. Um, because if we come at it as like, okay, this is what it is. Let's, let's get to work. But, you know, it's, going to make that patient or that person feel more comfortable to be more open about what's going on and what their experiences are. Um, if a person self or discloses self-harm, ask about how and what self-harming helps before talking about stopping. So, you know, if somebody comes to you and they say, I self-harm, you don't want to say, okay, well, we need to find ways to stop. Uh, this is unhealthy. This is not a good thing. It's bad. Um, no, we don't want to do that. We want to get to know more about the reasons behind the self-harm before we talk about stopping. Um, it's just like somebody that has an alcohol or drug problem. You know, we don't immediately say, okay, you need to stop this. Uh, we basically try to figure out and get behind the scenes. What is causing them to turn to drugs and alcohol um, as a way of cope? What is their reason of self-harming? Um, and don't forget, talking about self-harm is a first step towards managing and changing those behaviors. So over on the right hand of the slide, these are some really great questions that you can ask people. Um, so you want to be curious because if you show that you're curious, it, it also shows that you are caring. Um, you want to get to know this person better and, you know, because if we can understand them better, then we can help them better. So you might ask, how does self-injury help them? Ask them why now? Why, you know, why are we self-injuring now when we didn't do this, you know, years ago? You can ask, also ask, um, what might this behavior be trying to express? So this is going to help them to start identifying some of those emotions. Um, you can also discuss the patterns and the self-awareness around that self-harm. Ask about times when the person was able to resist their self-harm. Ask if the behavior is getting better or worse. Um, you can ask the person to track the behavior on a calendar to see if it follows a pattern. Um, that can be very helpful because if we can track and, and see that there's a pattern, then we can start to identify, okay, well, what happened on those days that I self-harmed, um, you know, that maybe I can do differently next time or I can cope better. Um, so I definitely tracking can be very helpful. And then you can look at discussing learning new behavior. So you can make a list of other options that have been successful. You can make a list of new behaviors to try and ask for an agreement to try an alternative or before reverting to self-harm. So there are some, uh, some forms that people may have them sign like a like a um, like an agreement that they won't um, hurt themselves um, or attempt suicide. And that is not what this is talking about. So this agreement is basically not telling them to not uh, self-harm, but asking them to try to figure out ways and agree to trying something different before they revert to self-harming. These are some um, helpful tools that can be um, used when working with somebody that is engaging in self-harm. So again, we have the mindfulness that includes deep breathing, guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation. If you're unfamiliar with uh, mindfulness, I there's if you just Google mindfulness, there are so many different um, websites. And on YouTube, there is a channel called The Honest Guys that I absolutely love. Um, they're from Australia, so they have that really cool accent and they have these very deep, soothing and calming voices. And the reason why I love their videos so much is because all I have to do is put my earbuds in and listen, and they guide me through the deep breathing. They guide me through muscle relaxation. Um, so it's very, very simple. 
You can create a fidget toolbox for people. Um, so fidget spinners, rings, anything squishy or slimy, infinity cubes. Um, and there's so many different types of fidget toys on Amazon, but those can be helpful um, to have those there for people that may be feeling really anxious um, and they may be thinking about self-harming. You can also encourage them to find new coping skills. There are, I mean, there's just really endless amounts of coping skills, which is a good thing, but it can also be frustrating because I could tell you that listening to music and going for a walk are my two things that make me feel so much better. Well, just because those make me feel better, it's not going to make everyone feel better. So a person kind of has to pick and choose, and it's kind of trial and error to figure out what's going to work best for them. And then we also have harm minimization strategies. Um, these are common ones that people may do. So they may snap a rubber band on their wrist, pinch themselves. They may paint red lines on their skin to um, mimic a cut or that it's bleeding, or they may hold ice in their hand, or I've seen people put salt on their hand and then uh, push an ice cube against it. Because when that ice and that salt combine, it creates a burning sensation. And so some people may find these helpful, but there's been research that shows that most people that engage in self-harming do not find these to be helpful. Um, I never recommend the harm minimization strategies unless they are being monitored um, pretty closely by some type of licensed professional. Um, and really, I just look at this as, you know, if somebody has an alcohol problem and they're trying to quit alcohol, but you say, well, instead of drinking, you know, alcohol, why don't you drink like something like Odul's that has no alcohol? It's a non-alcoholic beer, even though there is a very, very, very tiny percentage of alcohol in it. It's pretty much alcohol less. Um, I see that as a way of, you know, it, it could lead to somebody to relapse, um, you know, because they're getting all of those sensations um, when they would drink alcohol, except they're not getting that that buzz. So it may lead them to start drinking again. Same thing with the self-harm. Um, you know, they may get some satisfaction, but it's probably not going to take place of them actually harming themselves. Um, so if they're in a time where they're really frustrated and they try these and they feel it's not helpful, then that's where they could relapse and start help harming themselves again. And this is just a little quick video. I always play this um, and it's basically just what not to do. Um, if you ever watch the Bob Newhart show, um, this is a clip from that. And it's just something to kind of lighten the air a little bit because I I always have to talk about really tough and difficult things. And I'm I'm a pretty goofy person. So I like to, you know, try to put some kind of fun into it, I guess. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Still being very alive in a box. Yes, yes, that's me. <laughs> Should I lay down? Oh, no, 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 we don't, we don't do that anymore. Just, just have a seat. And uh, let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge five dollars for the for the first five minutes, and, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can I can almost guarantee you that that our session won't last the full uh, the full five minutes. Now, um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow. Okay. And, I, and I, I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <laughs> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has, has, has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, but 
truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, you're, you're there. Stop it! I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I can tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. It is. Then stop it. I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. We, we, we don't go there. Just, just stop it. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. It's only been, it's only been three minutes, so that will be uh, uh, three dollars. Uh, I only have a five, so. Well, I, I don't, I don't make change. Then I, I guess I'll take the full five minutes. Fine. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you would you like to address? <clears throat> Whew, uh, I'm bulimic. I stick my fingers down my throat. Stop it! Not a some kind. Kettle tube. My mom used to call me. No, 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 no. No, we don't go there. But I've been having this dream. No, we don't go there either. But my horoscope did say... We definitely don't go there. Just, <laughs> just stop it. What, what, what else? Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it. <laughs> Big baby. I wash my hands a lot. That's all right. It is? I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs out there. Uh -huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! <laughs> how, how are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook! Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! <sighs> what's, what's the problem, Catherine? I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. So you think we're, we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me, uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you, want, you want to get a pad and a pencil for this one? All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here are the ten words. Stop it or I'll bury you alive in a box! All right, so yeah, so that is one thing we don't want to do is just to tell them to stop it um, as much as we would want to. It's definitely not effective. Um, so these are some great resources um, to get help. We have our crisis text line where people can talk um, and text somebody 24-7 uh, for crisis support. Um, NAMI is our National Alliance on Mental Illness. They have lots of resource and information on eating disorders, self-harm, and other mental health issues. 
We have SAMHSA. Um, they offer resources and mental health issues and substance use issues. I absolutely love them. If you go to their publications um, on their website, you can order. They have thousands and thousands of brochures and handouts and books that you can get for free. Even shipping is free. Um, so I highly recommend checking out all of their resources. And then they also have um, a confidential um, referral uh, hotline 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then locally, we have our help for wv.com. So this is our support services here in West Virginia. Um, they offer resources and referrals for mental health and substance use. So through a database system. So if you contact them, let them know the situation, they can um, identify some uh, treatment resources for that person. They also have online chat um, and uh someone that you can call and text 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we had a couple, you are more than welcome to email me um, with questions, concerns. If you would like me to, you know, come do a training for your place of employment, anything like that, please, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, like I had mentioned before, there were a couple of questions we had. I don't know everything. I don't try to pretend I know everything. Um, so if I don't know the answer, I will be upfront and honest and let you know that, but I will definitely do my research to get that answer for you. Um, so just like some of the questions that we had received, um, if the the two that had sent questions, um, if let's see, I think it was uh, Debbie Rains and Heather Stallnacker. Um, um, if you can get I, us, our I went I went ahead and grabbed those and sent them to you in an email already. Okay, no, I have those, but okay. I don't have um, their emails to respond back to them. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. So yeah, if you guys just, just send me an email or if you just put your email um, in the chat, I can definitely get those um, questions answered for you. So that is it. Okay, it looks like there's a couple new messages. Let me see what they say. And I did put up a new survey link that should work. So if you had trouble with the first one, it should work. Let me see what the messages are. Okay, I think we are good. And like we say, if you have any questions, um, do your do your survey, and we will also send out that link again in your emails. And those emails and certificates will not start going out until Friday. So don't email Rebecca um, until or Becky White until maybe Monday, if you haven't gotten your, your certificate. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Autumn, for a wonderful presentation. And we will see you next month for our next webinar. So have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.